Hello, my name is Sarah Nieves, and I will be digging with you into the Staffordshire Horde, particularly aspects of its war gear and the Christian objects that still continue to astound researchers. Um, it is very similar to Sutton Who, but this thing is a horde on its own. Well, let's go. Let's do this. So the Staffordshire Horde was discovered in 2009 by a metal detectorist and it encompasses over 3,500 separate items. That's a lot of gold. Art historian Benjamin Tillman also points out that there is no satisfactory explanation for the origins of the Horde or the reasons for its deposit in the ground. But researchers have tried and will try with them. First, we have to go into the history, but I'll be honest, it is a challenge. Still, we do have some insights. First, the Horde was buried sometime in the middle of the 7th century, and this was a very chaotic time in Britain, which was formed of a series of small kingdoms divided by race, religion, and inconstant conflict, basically. While the Celts moved west, Germanic paganism was put into question by the evangelical approach of Christianity. Interestingly enough, though, the Horde itself is found smack right in the middle of these forces. It was right in the center of Britain at the time of the last pagan warrior king, Penda of Mercia. I keep the name Mercia in mind. Uh, the kingdom of Mercia was considered... Uh, expansionist and even aggressive, uh, the Horde was buried around AD 650 to 670, which is a time when ambitious Mercian rulers like Penda himself were fighting these wars with Northumbria and East Anglia. It makes sense then that research has actually identified some of the metal work is very typical of East Anglia, so they pr probably took something from here and put it over here. Let's just say that. One of the most attractive aspects of the Horde is that it is completely wrapped in mystery. There is one curious suggestion from scholars that this Horde was only part of a much larger assemblage and that it was randomly divided in two or even three deposits. <laughs> That's a lot of gold. When we look back at things like Beowulf, the lords with gold to spend, the tales of beard treasure, and you know, gold adorned weapons kind of stop being an exaggeration. And when it comes for the reason of, for burying this thing, there are a variety of theories as to why. Some consider it that it could have been a religious offering or a trophy collection, or even a bank of valuables that you could just dip in when you needed it. And others also pose that it could just have been buried for safekeeping, which is very probable considering the times. So what makes up the Horde? I'll be focusing on the war gear and Christian objects of the Horde, but it's always good to have like a bird's eye view of the items in it. Uh, it'll give us a little bit more of context as we move forth. So most of the Horde is what has been called by sources war gear, and most of them are well, made of gold. There are sort fittings like the stylized horse over here, and other ornamental elements of helmets and decorative fittings assumed to have come from scabbards and shields. There are also parts of a saddle, like the gold and garnet strip that could have belonged to a lot of things, to be quite honest, or the fish and eagle plague that was more possibly used for the back of a saddle of a prince or a king. It's incredibly finely crafted. Uh, there were also like belt buckles, we call these uh, sword pyramids, which were attached to the leather strip that kept the sword in the scabbard, and we'll come back to these guys later. As with many things Anglo-Saxon, these objects, all of them, do invite us to study it up close. It also counts with items that have Christian associations. There are three crosses within the Horde and possible elements of bookbinding. Of those that have been identified, meaning objects in the Horde, uh, the Staffordshire Horde website actually points a curious note. Uh, there are very close similarities in the style and technique of the objects from the famous royal burial site at Sutton Hoo. And they say that this suggests that some of the Horde objects may have been actually made in the same workshop. So, 
Very interesting. Well, let's go to war then. Most of the horde objects were martial. Uh, amongst these, the large seeks or knife, the helmet, the fittings, and some of the sword fittings that are larger and more finely decorated than the rest. Objects like swords received a very special type of almost ritualistic treatment that, uh, well, they were basically put apart. Considering Mercia and the aspect of war gear, researchers argue that whoever owned the horde was very high status and that it came from elite warriors. They state that quantity and quality of the weaponry in the graves must reflect not only the types of military equipment, but also the social, economic, and even legal status of the individual. Now, the horde itself is no warrior grave like Sutton Hoo, but the items still speak of the probable social status of the individuals that period it, and even aspects of social certification. In fact, the horde itself actually does give us a kind of a sense of hierarchy to the objects. This doesn't mean that there are any poorly made objects but that some of them just look finer and more realized with the items that they're using. And this is one of those examples. So a Sikh's knife was a, basically a large single-bladed knife, often used for fighting or hunting. And over here we have probably the finest Sikh's hilt colors found in the horde. Uh, the probability that the Sikhs itself belong to a prince or other royal leader, I mean, look at it, it's very, very high, and it further emphasizes the idea of a horde containing items of high social status. On the point of swords and blade, there are about 74 pommels in the horde, pommels being that tip of the hilt of the sword that anchors the hilt fittings to the sword blade. All of them do have something in common with the rest of the horde. In some of them you have the very rich and gold filigree ornament comprising of these wires that roll and twist around. And in others you have an ingarnet set cloison and work with shaped slices of ruby red garnet like red held right there in the golden cells. The garnets themselves were principally imported from northern India and even some from the Czech Republic. There are no natural deposits of gold either in England, so all of these little items kind of add a sense of internationality to the hoard. Now the quality of materials and the refinements of the decorations is not always the same. The silver gilded pommel cap is older and lacking the number of insect garnets that we saw in the earlier one, and that sense of stratification within the hoard becomes a little bit more apparent. But also the aspect of time. This one here is actually older than the gold and garnet pommel cap and was possibly older by the time it was buried. Now remember the little belt buckles called sword pyramids that I said we were coming back to? Here's another example. There's a lot of precision needed to cut these stones into these little shapes and it speaks of the status of the owner. Uh, they are hollow inside with little bars that kind of across the opening and it makes researchers think that it was kind of a belt buckle on the leather strap that held the sword to the scabbard. And this was also a symbol of status for the wearer. There we go with social status again. And then there's the helmet. I'm not gonna delve too much into the helmet, that's another project on its own, but the Staffordshire whole helmet would have probably not served as a helmet used for war but its distinctive nature, this war kind of like mentality sneaks into it, and the quality of its materials do continue to point in the direction that these items came from high status. Take into consideration that only five helmets of these type, five helmets uh, are known. The detail, you know, the bold crested design means that the Staffordshire helmet is likely to have had a very important owner. Other pieces are said to have made a third of the hoard, and sadly they could not have been used to reconstruct the helmet itself, but they do allow us to explore how it could have looked like, and here we have a very nice reconstruction. In the film that I watched, a short film of History West Miss Lamb called uh, The Wealth of Anglo-Saxon Mercia, historian and author John Hunt reminds us that at the heart of royal power was the ability to attract warband. 
There is something to be said about where one puts their gold, and the fact that the elite Anglo-Saxons that buried it put so much of it into weapons possibly confirms what Dr. Hunt said. Now, before I let you guys go, I do have to mention the Christian objects. They do seem curious when buried together with war regalia. It is possible that they were taken into one of the many battles of Mercia, but there could be some more, something more to these items. We have a pectoral cross of the time that was found within the hoard. Uh, it's pretty bent, and one of the arms was lost. Uh, the arms on the backs are actually hollow, and so is the center of it. It means that it probably held some relics that, of course, are now missing. The probability is that the church uh, was at the time, it wasn't very strong in Mercia, needless to say. So it makes us ask questions like, did a pagan like Penda actually capture them? Or was the damage done in battles between Christians? Uh, could it be that the Horde instead offers a glimpse of Mercia right before its Christianization? There are some that say that this cross is actually like a sign of the evangelic efforts before it was buried. There are a lot of interesting conjectures about this little one. Now, of the Christian's items, the one that caught my attention the most uh, is this one. The Staffordshire Horde item 550, better known as the inscribed strip, has been called by some scholars as a, a ward against evil. It, now it's folded, but back in the day it would have been laid flat. The inscription would be translated into Rise, o, rise up, O Lord, and may thy enemies be scattered, and those who hate thee flee from thy face, which is Numbers 10.35. Possibly attached to another object, what it belonged to is as curious as its probable function. The inscription itself is very similar to Psalm 67.2, and in a way, a research into this particular item reveals that the psalm was probably the verse they were referring to, if not the inspiration for the inscription that ended up being chosen from the Book of Numbers. The interesting part of this object is that in Anglo-Saxon England, we do find social context for the gold strip and the inscription in two saints betai. The Saint Bitae of Saint Anthony, for example, uh, speaks that he was one of those that at the time used psalms to repel demons, and there are specific occasions of him using Psalm 67 too. And similar inscriptions of the time, text like this is presented as a kind of a charm for warding off evil and achieving victory over enemies. And it wasn't just spiritual enemies wasn't just spiritual protection, but protection in warfare, which does kind of fit the context of Psalm and the numbers uh, verses that we describe. Nevertheless, uh, kind of a warlike theme on the inscription fits pretty well with the rest of the military objects in the Horde. This has been a little bit of insight into the Staffordshire Horde, the war gear, and some of the uh, Christian items. I hope you enjoyed it, and thank you.